Uh, well, I'm Michael Peel, and I'm the Vice President of Marketing for Beverly Hanks Realtors, which is based in Asheville, North Carolina. And if you're not familiar with Asheville, Asheville's kind of in the western part of west of, of North Carolina. Um, we Our service area is about nine counties, but if you're familiar with the area, you know that Asheville is kind of a, a cool, fun little town, about approximately a little less than 100,000 people, but it gets rural pretty quick as you move out from Asheville. So we've got a pretty diverse marketplace that we work in. Um, Beverly Hanks is a family owned independent business, been in business since 1976. We have a, a residential um, division which has about 370 agents or so, and we have a commercial division, and then we actually are also a mortgage uh, bank. Uh, so pretty well diversified uh, real estate company. Yeah, very cool. No, thanks, Mike. And, I'll be, and uh, look, I'm Mike Feller um, from uh, Active Pipe as well, and obviously really excited to have Mike join us here today. Um, we'll get into the the main part of the topic here around you know getting you know gathering more uh, listings in this environment and how to win more listings and and some you know strategies to do that. Um, before we do that though, Mike, look, I, I've probably said this to you a number of times, but you know one of the things I've always enjoyed about our conversations, you're one of the sharper tech minds that I've come across in in the space, and 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 I'd love to. You even just spend a few minutes here while people are just kind of jumping on is just sharing maybe a little bit more about your background, maybe even prior to Beverly Hanks, just so the audience can kind of get a sense of kind of where you're coming from. Sure. Well, I'm fortunate that I are fortunate and unfortunate that I've got the most untech background you could have for somebody in my role, but I've had the really unique opportunity to work with a great team and Neil Hanks, the owner of Beverly Hanks and Associates who enjoys investing in marketing and technology. So we have had the opportunity to build a lot of stuff from the ground up, but I have worked in marketing my entire professional career. And, you know, and I'm always said, I've always said that uh, I'm lucky in the sense that I had one foot in what I would call old traditional marketing. Um, you know, I'm 47 years old and kind of graduated in digital web wasn't really a thing yet, but pretty early on in my career, it became a thing. Um, sure. So I had the opportunity to kind of follow that curve up. And uh, so tech and marketing have always kind of gone hand in hand for me. I was involved with building some websites on the nonprofit area. I was director of outreach services for a large national nonprofit and got the chance to kind of work there and build some outreach tools, email marketing tech tools there. And that just carried over into real estate. I did work as a real estate agent for a number of years, came from a family that has a strong kind of real estate background, both in sales and leasing and all those kind of things and a father who worked in that area a bit. Um, so kind of knew that world and then wound up working for Beverly Hanks uh, starting 16 years ago. And I've been in this role for about 10 years. So got the chance to kind of really ride this wave of kind of Mark, MarTech, PropTech, kind of as it's been evolving over the past, you know, 10 years. Yeah, totally. I imagine, Mike, I'm curious how, how that experience at the nonprofits and, and all that has kind of, are there certain things that kind of you know, going through that to have really kind of helped mold sort of the way you approach things now? I do. I, you know, nonprofit world is interesting because, you know, at the end of the day, you're trying to get, at that point, trying to get people to give you money for nothing just to feel good. <laughs> uh, so if you want to talk about a tough sales job, okay. try convincing people to give you money to support good work, um, but not really get much in return. So I, it really has, it forces you to hone your message more than anything. I mean, you really have to figure out who you are and what you're all about um, and be able to play upon, that's probably the wrong word, but a little too manipulative, but, you know, work people's emotions to get them to connect with your message and why they want to be involved. And there's a big piece of that when I came to Beverly Hanks, thinking about real estate from a lifestyle perspective and why people make some of the choices they do around real estate and certainly how I want people to perceive Beverly Hanks as a brand. So I would kind of say those things all were characterized by that or help uh, inform that those come some of our approaches. Yeah, sure. And I'm always interested how, you know, people that come from a, you know, maybe a diverse background or a background that's even initially outside of real estate or outside of technology and how that shapes, you know, yeah. their strategy and their thinking, uh, you know, in their current role. So now very cool. Yeah. So, be, go ahead. No, no, go for it. I was going to say, you know, the, the, even a little bit further back, I worked in uh, an area that was thought I was going to go work for resorts and tourism. And again, that lifestyle piece kind of, I think, really kicks in when you think about how people make those decisions. So, you know, when I think about all of that leading up to where we're at and what real estate marketing has become, it's, you know, it's all become all about lifestyle, all about the individual. And I think those were all informed by some of those early experiences. Yeah, totally. 
No, great to hear. So, no, no, I appreciate that, Mike. So, and again, thank you all for joining us here. Uh, again, if you haven't um, in the chat, just let us know sort of where you're coming in, where you're calling in from, whether you're a broker or an agent, that'd be super helpful. And then, Mike, if it's cool with you, why don't we jump into sort of the bulk of the of the uh, topic here in the conversation. And so, you know, obviously today we're talking about how to kind of gain more listings, you know, in this environment. And you and I have talked about some of the things that, you know, I think that your approach, especially around sort of the ninja approach um, and how you talk about pain and, and all that is, is very different. But I'm curious, like, you know, what are some of the things that, you know, from your perspective that you'd want to share, you know, as some of these strategies around winning more listings? Um, love to have, just kind of jump into the meat of it here. Yeah, sure. I mean, uh, Beverly Hanks adopted Ninja probably about 10 years ago. And so I've had the opportunity to go through several iterations of Ninja selling, including several installations, whatnot. And there's no question that all of the marketing tools and services that we've built are all built around the Ninja philosophy. And we've certainly put our own spin on things, but at the very core, I mean, Ninja has informed a lot of what we've done. So when you and I started talking about this topic, you know, I immediately kind of default to those strategies that we know generates listings for agents. So, you know, as I thought about this, this, this is a topic that's been covered many, many times. Um, and so I, I thought, well, you know, if an agent walked into my office and said, I need to get more listings today, what, what would be the first advice I would give them? And, you know, uh, and so the first thing that always comes to mind, especially in a market with so much uncertainty right now, I mean, like you and I were saying 90 days ago, nobody knew what was going to happen with yeah. the market. Yeah. And even now, it, it, while it's positive in a lot of parts of the country, it's a bit crazy. I mean, you've got some really interesting dynamics. So I think the whole concept of real estate reviews, that is a core piece of what we teach agents at Beverly Hanks. Um, and I think it's really that idea of being, you know, a bit of a thought leader around real estate and helping people to get comfortable and confident about where they're at in the market. And, you know, especially for agents that have a book of business, and even if they don't have a book of business, family, friends, whoever, um, just going through that process of doing some real estate reviews and sharing that with people and kind of being that thought leader and educating them about the market is one of the best things you can do. And I, and I think that demonstrates value. And it demonstrates that the, that the agent is engaged and cares about the individual. And I think that just inevitably, you know, leads to business. I mean, I know that, you know, in Ninja, they'll, they'll talk about each client being, you know, th the gateway to three or four other transactions. So to me, demonstrating that you're proficient in the market, understand the market, um, and, and can help that person make some decisions about the market, even if they have no plans of buying or selling, it is probably one of the easiest ways to kind of get that ball rolling and, and get some momentum going. Yeah, sure. And Mike, it might be worth even for some of us, some of the folks that join us that maybe are not as familiar with Ninja, even just to spend a minute or two just to kind of lay out just the basic premise behind that. Yeah, sure. I'm no Larry Kendall, so I'm, I'm probably <laughs> not going to do this justice. But I would certainly say that it's really about, you know, his big thing is attracting, right, and offering value and it to be less about selling, even though ninja selling is the term that he's coined and been famous for. I've, I've uh, had the opportunity to meet Larry several times and talk to him, and I don't think there's anybody in the industry that has impressed me more, had more of an impact. But it is about that relationship piece. It's, it's about that one-to-one -one and the value of the individual, I think, more than anything. Yeah, totally. No, that's great. Um, look, I think you could speak to that better than I can. So I figured I'd at least tee you, you up with that question versus me answering it. So, uh, you know, with reviews, you know, I'd love to understand with that, like, take that a step further. Like, so in knowing that reviews are so important right now, um, one of the things that, uh, you know, I generally ask later on in the conversation, I'm actually going to move it up a little bit here, uh, is, you know, on a tactile level, like what's something around reviews, and you talked about that specifically, that for those listening right now that they could go and implement today or tomorrow? I mean, the very first thing I would start with, you know, I always think about that, that NAR diagram that they use every year that shows where the sources of business come from. You know, as you're coaching agents and we're thinking about building even the marketing plans for the brokerage, you know, if we know 65% of business thereabouts is sphere of influence business, I would start with my database. You know, I would start with my CRM, I'd open it up, and if I was really going to get tactical, I would look at what years or how long people had been living in their particular house, right? Because we know that after about 10 years, the eight to 10 years, there can be some movement. That's usually a big chunk of a person's life, a phase of life, you know, and one of the things Larry and Ninja teaches those is to look for pain and pleasure. So I would first start by looking at my database, 
either using tax records or if I had transaction history, look at how long they've been in that house. Mm -hmm. And then I would conduct, you know, a real estate review, look at the market, give them a, a, a broad overview of what's going on in their neighborhood, kind of how that's impacted, you know, their position in their market and excuse me, in their house, you know, with equity and whatnot, and just really do it as a service. And, and again, um, develop, demonstrate proficiency. And then just, just leave it at that. I mean, that's what I would do. I would look for people that are kind of at that stage where they might be making a move. Um, think about whether they've had some changes in life circumstances that might motivate them to kind of make a change and then do that, you know, do that real estate review and call them up and say that I have some information. And, and that's the whole thing with the market being crazy. I mean, people want to know. It's just like back in 2010, you know, this is the opposite situation of 2010 where, you know, people were watching their values get really depressed. Now values are really cranked up and, you know, people probably are losing track of the equity that they have. Yeah, sure. Now, when you talk about that eight to 10 year threshold, if you will, um, are you are you guys literally thinking about that again, kind of staying on a tactical level here? Are you guys thinking about this from, because what I'm hearing about this, you know, what you said is really from a segmentation point of view. Are you kind of segmenting it sort of uh, below eight years in the house and then maybe people that are above eight in the years in the house? And then ultimately, are you treating the reviews separately for each each segment? You know, that's really at an individual agent level. So I, I would, couldn't speak to that. I could say what I would do, you know, which is certainly I would segment because, you know, those are different groups. And one of the things I think the industry as a whole doesn't do a good enough job at is, you know, developing segmentation and altering the messaging and whatnot. I think agents feel the need to be everything to everybody. And, you know, when I look at our most successful agents or kind of uh, study successful agents in other marketplaces, um, talking to some of the more firms that we're friendly with, the agents that are just, you know, knock it out of the park are always the ones that have a niche, you know, and that niche can be geography, it can be life stage, it can be all sorts of different things. But I think it's because they can tailor the message to the audience. And so in this case, if I were taking that approach, I would break it down based on the year. Um, you know, one of the other strategies to kind of jump uh, that you and I talked about was I'd be mining the heck out of social media right now, you know, to get an idea if there is any pain or pleasure, you know? So, I mean, I think that's one of the things that agents think Facebook and Instagram is just about broadcasting. Um, I think it's the most value is the exact opposite is just listening um, and looking for people talking about hating the fact that the gym's closed and they can't go work out. And you're like, well, there's pain right there. I mean, you got somebody that's a health nut that is, works out in the gym five days a week and they're rel living in a relatively small house and they've been in that house for eight years. My message is gonna be a lot different for that group that, you know, than somebody who you know, maybe has had additions to the family or they're empty nesters. But you know, I, I think COVID has, for the industry, and I think it's one of the reasons the industry is so fired up right now, it's really changed the way people think about home. And, I, and that's sort of sounding cliche at this point. I'm, I'm mm -hmm. certainly not the author of that, but I think as an agent, that's what I would be looking for. I mean, whose circumstances have changed um, and that would encourage them to want to make a, a move. And, you know, if we're talking about getting listings today, I mean, that's who I would be focused on. You know, they've been in that house eight, 10 years. Uh, they've got some equity. They're complaining on social media about, you know, the gym being closed, not having a home office, not having two home offices. That was my wife and I's situation. We were fortunate. We moved last fall into a house and we had two home offices. And we're like, what are we ever going to do with two home offices? Come March, right? <laughs> like, like, yeah. like, we're both working 100% from home. Uh, that's got to become very uh, evident. So I think there's a lot of people that are in those kind of scenarios, outdoor space, you know, for gardening, all these trends that have taken off with homesteading, I think, and all that stuff. So I'd be mining social media for people talking about those kinds of things and kind of rolling all that together and then creating messaging, you know, using a platform like Active Pipe or something like that to segment those messages and monitor who's interacting with what and then kind of expanding on that. Yeah, no, totally. And uh, like what I find really interesting about that is, you know, two things. One, you're using social media as a source to gather data, right? Is using it as a source to do some research, to understand what are some of these signals or pains as you're alluding to here. That's one thing. I think the other side of this, and I think you and I have talked about this previously before, um, the pains that people are experiencing now are very different than even three months ago, right? And, and so that's one of the things that 
this is such a uh, fast moving and, and excel, you know, the, the situation's evolving very, very quickly. So how would you think about like it maybe, you know, how, what, what advice would you give for somebody that if they're going on social and you've identified some of these things around the different offices and signals, but like maybe take that a step further and think about, okay, how else could people gather some insights there to be able to arm themselves to really uh, to provide this valuable insight that you're alluding to? Well, you know, I, I think, you know, when sometimes when you start talking about analyzing social data, people start to get nervous, you know, from a data privacy perspective. And I, I think that's the key here is I'm, I'm taking a very ninja approach to this. And I'm not sure if I'm answering your question exactly right, but I would be really focused on a one to one, right? You know, I'm thinking about who's in my database that I have, you know, they know, like, and trust me already. Um, and then I'd be looking for those, you know, the, and it can be pleasure too. I mean, you know, Ninja teaches both pain and pleasure. I think there's been more pain lately than pleasure. Um, but, cause, but I think that's where I would be starting it. And then I'd be developing, you know, some marketing that speaks to segmented groups and then watching for signals. You know, that's always the key. I think, did they click on a link that talked about a particular neighborhood or did they, you know, click on a link about raising backyard chickens. You know, I would be thoughtful in that content that I was building to try to elicit responses back that could help me kind of reach out to them probably at that point in a more personal way, phone call, note card, you know, I mean, something even one step further um, down that funnel of being just that much more personal. Um, so I think at that point, it's becoming, you know, a one-to-one. -one. I mean, you're, you're going deep ninja at that point in time and it, it really would be face-to-face. Yeah, totally. And I think there's different ways too, where you can experiment a little bit with that content, right? You can experiment a little bit of that content and maybe, you know, if you had a database of 500 people, um, as an example, you know, speaking to your segmentation, maybe you send a certain piece of content to 50, test and understand, okay, what does that, um, what does that response look like? And then maybe send a separate piece of content to another 50, right? And then you can start to understand Maybe how is your mark, you know, how's your marketing? How is your messaging? How's your content actually resonating? You sort of do some of these A and B testing a little bit, and then you under you can unlock and say, okay, this is what I actually want to roll out to the broader group, or maybe there's certain elements that I, I keep very specific. Yeah, I think that's the key. Developing those personas and refining those personas and keep tweaking that communication. You know, we're kind of making the assumption that there's a some type of response, but at least I was earlier. You know, and so I think monitoring for the lack of response, right? You know, I mean, and that's why when we build content, I try to have a blend, which is another ninja kind of philosophy of art and science, um, you know, really to kind of see what is they're interested in and then decide which, you know, if you're thinking about it in terms of a flow, which direction you're going to take them. Yeah. Uh, you know, so if somebody responds to a very technical about equity and interest rates and all that kind of stuff, that's given us some ideas about what that, what may be the way to that next piece of content might be for them, or if they go down the, the chicken route, you know, then we, we're probably thinking about something else. Well, totally. You know, once you identify what those personas look like, right, what those segments look like, then it's around, you know, structuring the content, the types of articles, the blogs, whatever it is that you can start, uh, you know, that, that you really can start getting more specific to their needs. And you can take you know, to people down different pathways, depending on their individual interests. And that's what I love about digital marketing. You know, we didn't have that back in the day. You know, you put a print ad out and maybe if you pull a focus group together, you'd have some idea of what 12 people thought about it. Mm -hmm. Versus now, you know, when we're building digital content and have the opportunity to kind of mine those metrics, I think that is the part that has really accelerated, you know, marketing intelligence and allow us to get a lot more sophisticated with what we're doing is, taking a look at how people are responding, what those signals are and refining the message as you go. It's become almost like a, sh uh, you know, a very um, shotgun approach. Um, actually, that's not the right term I'm looking for, but running gun, that's the, the you know, I mean like, you know, we're really kind of iterating on the fly um, <clears throat> to, to kind of keep get that messaging and, and look for those opportunities. Yeah, sure. No, that's great. So Mike, take this, take this further. So what other things are you seeing as far as uh, other strategies to, to looking at listings and if we want to win those today, what, what are some of those? Well, I, win, win's a great term because, right, I mean, it is more competitive right now than ever for listings. I mean, in most of the markets I'm familiar with um, that I'm, you know, front, have friends working, colleagues working in other markets, I mean, inventory is critically short. And, you know, if there's anything that's worrying me in the market, it, it's not the inability to show or any of that stuff. It's the fact that there's not enough property for agents to sell. So winning them, I think is key. 
And I think this, that during COVID, there is such an opportunity to demonstrate leadership. Um, you know, the, 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 there was a, an, or Neil Hanks likes to say a flight to quality. I think there has been a flight to quality. As a whole, people have, and I think you covered this with Stephanie a little bit, people have moved to brands that are well-established, well-credentialed, you know, have a history there that adapted to the COVID crisis well. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's one of the things that if agents have, can count themselves to be among that group, that's a really enviable place to be and to demonstrate that leadership to future listings. You know, there are a lot of agents who put their head in the sand and didn't come up for eight weeks, um, you know, because it was a scary place to be and consider and all that kind of stuff. And then there's other agents, you know, that innovated with virtual open houses, 3D tours, you know, virtual showings, you know, and counseling their clients virtually and all that stuff. And I think they should share that. I think they should show that stuff off and be like, hey, even during the worst pandemic that we have experienced in our lifetime, um, my business didn't stop. You know, I, I kept listing and selling. Now, granted, it got tamped way down, but I didn't stop. Sure. Um, and I think that's a big deal, you know, right now. Um, I, I, I have talked to some agents who are like, well, I wasn't sure what was going to happen. So I just pulled everything back and I'm like, well, you know, that's really not operating from a point of leadership. So if I, if an agent was in that position and they had that kind of history, I'd be making a big deal about it right now. Um, and, and kind of showing that off as a way to, you know, for people to flight to the quality. Yeah, sure. I mean, look, I, I think we've been pretty open that, uh, you know, the strategies you had in place prior to three months ago, they really don't exist anymore. Right. They just, the, the, you could probably in a lot of ways, you can throw those out the door. And now it's a matter of like, to your point, the people that have adapted and the people that have shifted the strategy and went out and executed, those are the people that are, are successful. And certainly, you know, when you look at this, you're talking a lot about leading from a position, you know, leadership, right, as, as being at the forefront in all this, and I think being very important. Now, I'm curious, are there other examples that you've seen of some agents that have done that really successfully, or some that have stood out to you that you've seen over the last couple of months and some things that they've done differently? You know, in our marketplace, for sure. I mean, I think, you know, Virtual open houses, I think, is one of the things, you know, open houses in general. Actually, this speaks right to what you were just talking about. So um, open houses are a big part of the Beverly Hanks kind of marketing plan. And we believe very strongly in having our agents face to face with as many people in the public as possible. So when you think about one of your cornerstones of your overall marketing plan for the entire brokerage just got thrown off the table. I mean, whoever thought that there'd be a time when we couldn't do open houses. Yeah. You know, so we had to think about that. So, um, you know, some of our agents jumped right on that and began testing virtual open houses right away. You know, like having an open house at a set time and showing off the property and using a lot of digital advertising and whatnot to promote the open house. And, I, you know, it's only anecdotally, but I know from talking to some of the agents that did that well, they had people that were looking at other listing agents call them and say, hey, I saw you do this. Will you come do one for me? And got a listing from it yeah you know and i think that's again that flight to quality and, you know innovating not kind of just waiting for stuff to happen um so i think you know a lot of it and, and again I, this is not stuff that isn't you know talked about a lot in the industry but some agents just do it i think that's the difference that i always say in real estate there's a huge spectrum in the quality of the agents and and i think you know if you're a consumer they know where the top agents are you know i always joke about the friends and family plan, you know, the agents that do one or two transactions with friends and family. And then there's those agents that really have a solid book of peripheral business. And I, I think the consumers know who they are and they will seek those out, um, you know, uh, when they need it. And I think times like this, they realize, hey, I can't let my, my brother-in-law kind of list the property. You know, sure. he's a part-time agent. I'm going with somebody that's doing this full-time and is really kind of making a, uh, some smart, innovative decisions, even under the, some of the most difficult times. Sure. No, I, I look, I love that example. And I actually love to hear a little bit more about like, you know, we spoke about it from an agent perspective, but are there other things that you guys did at the brokerage level um, to, to respond to that, to really help, um, you know, provide a service to the agents or a system in that time? Are there certain things that shifted from your strategy? I thought that was a great example, but I'd love to hear it from, from the brokerage side of things. Yeah, and I, well, I can speak to some things that our leadership did that I think are some of the most impressive things I've seen, some of the best demonstrations of leadership I've seen. So right when COVID was breaking, I mean, this was like probably early April, if I remember the dates right, um, Neil and his wife, uh, Hanks and his wife thought that, you know, they needed to do something for the community. They were watching all the restaurants and bars and independent businesses 
boarding up, I mean, literally boarding up as, you know, the COVID and the shutdowns were coming and stuff like that. Um, and also needed to kind of put a little bit of optimism and just kind of spark our agents um, and get them excited about where they lived and that this wasn't going to be the end. And so they stepped up right away and purchased uh, $50 of gift certificates for every agent and staff member of Beverly Hanks. Oh, wow. And so not only did they infuse a whole bunch of you know, income into these small businesses, but then gave those gift cards to the agents and the staff to you know, use for themselves or just share with friends and family who might have been hurting a little bit. And I mean, to me, that demonstrated leadership. It demonstrated, you know, that we understood what they were going through. We weren't hit as hard as a small local restaurant were, and they put resources up right away. And that had to have been a scary spot sure. because, you know, who knew what was going to happen to real estate? I mean, we were getting shut down. We couldn't show property, but they stepped up um, and we had so many people say such many things and that wasn't why it was done but it but it really it hit home at just the right moment no that's uh, awesome i mean first of all good for you guys uh, that's that's fantastic um no so i know we're coming up on time here mike i wanted to see if there's, if there's anything else remaining that you wanted to share in terms of strategies uh I'll give you an opportunity to do that before you move into the next part well, yeah and, I, and i'll just say you know just kind of finishing up the the ninja thing just flow right you know if we're talking about a highly competitive marketplace for listings um you know larry and i'm probably paraphrasing poorly would say that you know it's a, it's a quick kind of decision when people decide they're going to hire an agent right so mm -hmm. it's um they know nine to ten i mean we've heard all the, those stats over the years and you know they know nine to ten agents and they're going to pick an agent um, rather quickly when the time comes. And so I think as you're thinking about how do I get listings now, you got to be in flow, right? And I think agents always want to go to the PPC or some type of bulk strategy. Um, but really, I'd be doubling down on sphere and flow right now because those people's lives are changing. They're having pain and pleasure. They're going to be making decisions. And I'd make sure that I'm in flow with as many people as possible right now. Yeah. Meaningful flow. Um, yeah. so, if I, you know, if I were going to wrap that up, that'd be like, that is what I'd be doing. So, no, I love that. And then it, it comes down to content, right? Becoming, providing value in the form of content. So, no, I love that. So I will open this up to everybody, uh, with questions in a second. So actually, while I ask Mike, one more question here, if you, if you have anything, feel free to throw a question into the chat or the Q and A, and we'll spend a, we'll spend a few minutes on that. But what Mike, one, one of the things I was going to ask you here is that, you know, you and I chatted a little bit about the fact that uh, right now there's a lot of pent up demand, right? We see that, and obviously that's going to vary a little bit market by market. But as that dynamic has shifted a little bit, and we're starting to see a number of uh, markets on the on the rebound, and you've got this pent up demand. Are you guys thinking about things differently? Are there certain things that now, you know, moving forward, is there anything else different that you want to share maybe with the audience that would be related to that? Yeah, and so in Asheville, if you're not familiar, Asheville is a pretty desirable place. You know, we're, we're lucky in that there's a lot of people who want to live in Asheville because of a very high quality of life. And so, you know, some of the things we're doing right now that, I mean, literally what we're working on this morning um, is really thinking about some of the marketing we have going out to some of the feeder markets. And this is one of the things where I think digital can be very good, right? Mm -hmm. um, taking on very much an intercept strategy, you know, for people the Asheville's on the radar, but they're not, they've never really thought about owning property there. We're really working with this idea of second homes. You know, there's a lot of people I think that are within driving distance of Asheville, you know, and you can obviously now people are much more tolerant of a long drive than they might have been three months ago, but six to eight hours, you know, a lot of the East Coast is accessible to Asheville within six to eight hours, sure. um, you know, and even Chicago and New York are only 10. So we're beginning to think about how to shift our digital strategy to make sure those places are thinking about the benefits of owning second homes and whatnot in Asheville, um, in the Asheville area, the Asheville mountains, because there's a lot of people I think who are worried about or, um, a resurgence in COVID or, or some other thing that happens down the road. And they want to make sure they have a place to go to shelter in place. And if they're in a big city and they're in an apartment or they're someplace where they don't have access to the outdoors and that, that's an important part for them, they're, I think, are very open to the idea of kind of making sure they've got a placeholder that they can go to anytime they want. Awesome. And look, I'll be the first one to to say that yeah Asheville is a beautiful part of, in a beautiful part of the country for sure so 
Well, great. Well, th thank you, Mike. And uh, listen, I will spend a few minutes here. We'll want to open this up uh, to any questions. So feel free if you want to, to add a question or two into the chat and we'll see. Mike and I will do our best to address them. So maybe give uh, a few minutes for uh, questions here. So uh, who's winning, you or Trevor at golf, Mike? Oh, uh, with Travis? Yeah, Travis, sorry. <laughs> yeah, he's, uh, well, I'll go on camera, unfortunately. He's got the, he's probably got the overall lead with me right now, though I did get him last time. So we've got, uh, it's been a lot of fun. We've, we've been uh, playing a decent amount of golf together. So That's what I heard. Yeah. Now he'll, uh, I'll let you ask him directly as well. Yeah. <laughs> That's a lot of fun. It looks like we might be getting uh, getting off easy here, Mike. It looks like you did a good enough job explaining everything. There are no questions here. Okay. Oh, uh, here we go. There's there's one question from uh, a few folks, and then uh, let's see here. What's the latest idea uh, for real estate reviews during COVID? Would that be by mail or by phone? So I would be doing virtually Zoom. You know, I'd be kind of producing the the real estate review and then calling kind of reaching out to that person, maybe with social media messenger or something like that, and suggesting that we jump on a call again, getting as close to face and face as, as you can. Um, you know, I think uh, even depending on the marketplace, I might even try to do it in person, but keeping social distance. I just had my first meeting uh, a couple of weeks ago in per well, it was actually last week in person, where we went for a walk together <laughs> and we actually walked down the street, you know, approximately six feet apart and had our meeting that way outside because we were both comfortable with that. So I would, you know, again, whenever possible, get as close to face to face as possible. Sure, sure. Now you, uh, it looks like, there was one question that looks like a little bit more specific about ActivePipe, about adding articles or, or blogs. It, it, that's, that's actually, for us, it's pretty easy. If you go into the, into the UI and we're happy to spend time, Ellen, with you directly on, on training with this, but in the RSS feature, if you just literally drag that in uh, and, uh, you just click on the button in the bottom right hand corner and then you'll be able to get access sort of the blog library uh, that it's integrated with and then click the button and it brings it in the email. Again, I don't know that we want to necessarily spend a ton of time with that, but Ellen, feel free to reach out more than happy to, to go into a little bit more detail on that. Um, there was also a question about uh, from, let's see, from McRae about the, you know, please talk a little bit about the effective listing presentations during listing appointments. So McCray is one of the agents of Beverly Hank, so he's throwing a little bit of a softball there. But, um, <laughs> but I, you know, one of the things I always talk about uh, with agents is, or just think about it in terms of marketing in general for Beverly Hanks is, you know, past performance is the best indicator of future performance. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So I would always think about, you know, if you're in the position, the enviable position to be the market leader. And, you know, one of the things about real estate is it's so local and such a niche that you can really define what you're, the market leader of, you know, whether it's people on this side of the street or that side of the street or whatever, but I would always fall back to demonstrating results. You know, I think one of the things that often happens in this industry with listing appointments is there's a little bit like a tit for tat. Well, they've said they're going to advertise it here, here, and here, where are you going to advertise it? And then you're like, well, we got to do it here, 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 and here. Um, and it just becomes a little bit of an arms race. And I think shifting that conversation to being more results focused is the way to kind of make a listing presentation as effective as possible. So yeah. I don't know, there's lots of different ways to, to define results. Sure. But. Well, I'm glad we teed you up there well, Mike, um, on that one. But uh, there's an, also another question from Tom that asking about, do we think that traditional calling is still applicable? Every day. I mean, I think, especially in this day and age, where one, you know, people are a little bit more out than they were, you know, 30 days ago, but I think where people are tra trapped in their home, I think they're much more willing to talk to people these days than they maybe have been when they were in an office, you know, eight hours a day and had colleagues around them. So I would definitely be spending time reaching out to people, if for nothing else, just to check in on them and see, you know, how they're doing. Uh, you know, so I think that's a key piece of uh, just being a good person and a good agent. Yeah, totally. Well, listen, I know we're uh, a few minutes over. So Mike, for one, really appreciate you joining us. It's really uh, joining us here, and I really enjoyed the the conversation and uh, always great to catch up, man. And uh, thanks for doing this. And, and thank you everybody for joining. And then uh, we will be sending out, uh, you know, recording of this uh, for everybody that uh, attended. But again, thank you. Thank you, Mike. And uh, look forward to catching up again soon. Same here, Mike. Thank you very much. Great seeing you. Take care.